Thanks a lot. And uh, thank you very much for uh, this invitation to deliver this uh, 2022 Elizabeth Colburn uh, Memorial Lecture. Uh, as uh, the chair said, this uh, talk is about the role of computational fluid dynamics in the processing of complex fluids. This is work we have been carrying out at uh, UCL, the Department of Chemical Engineering, within uh, the Thames Multiphase Group. So uh, a few things about the motivation of what actually made us decide to work in this area. Um, this uh, grouping, I believe, is uh, aware of the increasing level of sophistication in modern uh, formulations that um, is uh, actually driven by the uh, changing customer demands, often for uh, bespoke products as well, but also the, the need to move to sustainable materials. Uh, the companies need to deliver a consistent product quality as well as meeting the customer expectations. Uh, but they face often uncertainties in the manufacturing processes um, uh, driven by uh, materials or uh, local uh, uh, variations. So in this case, computational fluid dynamics uh, has emerged as a tool to simulate the industrial operations in real conditions that can be used to design, but also to scale up the various processes. And um, um, it can, it needs to be combined though with experiments at appropriate scales. So what I'm going to uh, present to you is a number of uh, cases, case studies, where we have looked at the development and application of computational fluid dynamics tools for processes that involve complex formulations, complex fluids, and in particular, non-Newtonian fluids and dispersions. And the examples I will mention include both batch and continuous processes. What I will also argue during this talk is that the, uh, we need, uh, we have realized that there needs to be a synergistic approach between the modeling and the experiments, not just for the validation of the computational tools, which is very important, but also because together they can build, help us build a better and a fundamental process knowledge. So I will start with uh, some uh, batch examples, uh, batch mix mixing examples. Uh, mixing is a very common process in industry. And uh, a large part of what I'm going to show you is work that started with an EPSRC formulation grant, uh, CORAL, on the um, manufacturing of complex oral healthcare formulations. So what you see here is a typical um, uh, process uh, in the manufacturing of healthcare products of toothpaste, for example, uh, where the uh, gel is prepared initially, it is then mixed with uh, other uh, liquid phases to uh, moderate the modulate the rheology. And in the end, uh, there may be additions, uh, um, there may be more solid phases or other additives uh, included in the mixture. And all this at various stages involves mixing in uh, batch vessels. Uh, this is, uh, again, a process uh, quite common in uh, uh, healthcare industries, and um, um, one challenge that had been there was the fact that they uh, wanted the, uh, to include non aqueous uh, based formulations, where, again, the fluids uh, encountered can have different or would have different properties. Uh, let me see how I move now. Okay. Uh, to go like this. And uh, so what we uh, started doing is to develop the CFT, the computational tools to model uh, such uh, complex mixing processes. Uh, initially, we wanted to see what is the best way to include the fluid rheology, the uh, liquids rheology of the rheology of non-Newtonian uh, liquids in uh, these uh, CFT models. So the uh, mixtures we were working with were uh, carbopol gel in uh, uh, polyethylene glycol and glycerol mixtures. And these uh, mixtures can have uh, viscosities that depend, uh, of course, on the shear rates, but also on the gel uh, concentration and the temperature. So we did extensive experiments to develop the neurological model to characterize uh, these mixtures, which we then implemented in, uh, in our CFT uh, model of a, a stirred vessel. To start with, we used a simple geometry. You see here, a, a typical Rushton uh, turbine, just to make sure uh, that we could capture uh, the, the, this complex uh, rheological uh, mixture. 
So um, at the same time, the first level of, um, uh, of uh, let's say, validation we did was to, uh, to, to measure and to compute, to um, predict the power requirements in this vessel. And as you can see here, the measured values of the power number agreed very well with the CFD simulations. What, however, the CFD tool in this case uh, allowed us to do is to uh, see in more detail the, the, the flow field inside uh, the vessel for different fluids. You hear a typical Newtonian fluid. Uh, these are all uh, um, the very viscous formulations. The Reynolds numbers are very low, <clears throat> so we have uh, laminar conditions. But you see here the typical uh, pattern that you develop inside a stepped vessel with the two, uh, with the two circulation uh, zones. And uh, what um, I show you here is the velocities. But in this case, when we have a mixture of the gel <clears throat> at a certain temperature, um, the, the gel is uh, shear thinning. And uh, as you can see, the velocities are uh, really very much, um, um, the larger, the higher velocities are really very uh, around, uh, appear very close to the impeller, while the rest of the uh, volume here appears to not be uh, mixing very much. Of course, this is because uh, a Russian turbine has been used in this case. Um, the, to mix fluids like that, uh, industry is using more complex impellers. And you see here a schematic of uh, um, our, our lab version of a more complex uh, impeller and uh, vessel geometry that uh, can be used for the mixing of such fluids. And uh, we also tried to have a validation and a comparison between uh, what we have in experiments and the models in a more in a, in a, a next level. So in this case, we try to obtain the velocity uh, fields inside our uh, sorry, inside our vessel and to compare with the safety simulations. The, what we used to do that was a particle image velocimetry um, where we uh, put some tracers inside the uh, mass, uh, very uh, small particles inside the system and we tried to trace them with the uh, camera and uh, derive the velocity profiles. Um, this, um, of course, the uh, PAV technique is very powerful, um, but there are many limitations. In the current setup you see here, we can obtain information on velocity fields just on one plane. Um, and um, it does require optical access to the system. And uh, of course, if we need to obtain more whole volume information, we either need to use 3D PAV, which involves more cameras, or do a more complex experimental uh, approach. Um, just a couple more things about PAV. Uh, we need to, um, uh, what we do with PAV is we take images, um, two successive images at a very short time, and we try to cross correlate the uh, position of the particles in between these two images to derive the velocity profiles. Uh, the reason I'm mentioning that here is uh, because when experiments and models we really need to think what do the experiments show us, what we measure, and what we get from the models. For example, when we do PAV, we need to, uh, as I said, um, uh, measure in uh, uh, two planes that are a little bit displaced from each other. So if our plane of interest, for example, is this one, it means that we have to make a measurement just a little bit before and a little bit after. This position can be one or two degrees uh, difference. So, and by doing that, we actually get the average velocity on this plane. It's worth remembering that when we try to compare velocity profiles then from the measurements with the, uh, with the uh, safety simulations. We obtain this velocity field in, uh, uh, in our vessel uh, we're using PIV. And what I'll show you here is, I'll just present everything, uh, is that we compared these measurements with the CFD. Um, that confirmed to us, as you can see, the agreement is very good. And uh, that confirmed to us that the approach we use for the CFD, uh, in this case, the CFD was a little bit more complex than the one I showed you before with the Russian uh, turbine, because the, we also have the bufflers at the side of the vessel. And of course, the geometry is much more complex of the impeller. But the agreement was very good, as you can see the colors match. But also we uh, looked at the uh, velocities at, at this, uh, let's say, plane here. Uh, the two velocity components that we could measure from uh, PIV, the uh, radial and the vertical one. So the agreement is very good, and that uh, gave us confidence that the CFT tool could be used to uh, ob obtain more information about the flow. And the type of information we 
get is what you see here. And so what I have uh, plotted here is the isosurfaces of certain velocity magnitudes. And um, if we start from this corner here, where we have velocities that are 70% uh, of the velocity of the tip of the impeller, high velocities, we see that these high velocities are really limited very close to the impeller. If we uh, consider um, then lower velocities, 50% of the tip of the impeller, uh, we see yeah, that these velocities can be obtained a little bit further away from the impeller. Um, low, even lower velocities, we go a little bit further into our vessel. Uh, but as you can see here, um, a large part of the vessel still has only very low velocities. That may mean something about the mixing, which is what we try to do next. So um, what we saw before is what is the motion of the fluids inside the impeller. It gives us an indication of how the mixing is going to progress, but it's not a real, um, it doesn't tell us how long will mixing take. So this is the, the next step of what we have been doing. And uh, experimentally to obtain mixing, we used a planner, a laser induced fluorescence, where in our vessel, uh, we introduce a layer of our uh, um, um, a fluorescent dye, rhodamine uh, 6G in this case, and um, we uh, measure the time it takes to fully mix into our system. The setup is quite similar to what we use with the PAV. Again, we need a camera or laser to illuminate the flow, and we obtain images over time. And these are the results again from the experiments in this case. Um, so that's the, uh, what we get is um, in the beginning, the dye is all on the top, and then it starts, the impeller starts moving it downwards and it takes so long to have this uh, uniform um, concentration in the vessel and if we want to quantify that we can um, uh, de derive calculate this parameter which is um, the difference of the concentration um, in um, of average concentration at each point of the vessel um, compared to the one the final one to the uniform one so this will give us the time it takes to fully mix um, the mixing, modeling mixing with CFD can be a little bit more uh, challenging, and there are various approaches. One approach is to actually use the, uh, we can model the uh, concentration of a tracer inside CFD. Um, sometimes this approach suffers from a numerical diffusion. Um, if, the, uh, if the numerical diffusion is comparable to the actual physical diffusion, then the results are not so clear. Um, I'll show you some results later where we have used that approach, but what I'm showing you here is a different way of approaching the mixing, modeling of mixing, um, where what we do, what we did is that we actually modeled the, the flow field just using a, a, a fluent, in this case, um, CFT software, and then we extracted the velocity, the velocity field from a fluent into MATLAB, and uh, we try to see how these velocities um, would move massless particles inside our vessel. Let me see if that is playing. And these massless particles represent concentration of the dye. So if I leave it playing, you will see that after a while, the particles start mixing with the vessel. And uh, we um, correlated this local particle concentration to dye, let's say, a tracer concentration, and uh, we could get the mixing in this case, which we can then compare with the uh, results, the experimental results we had before. Um, this is a, a nice technique. Uh, it does require lots of particles if we want to uh, properly capture this uh, concentration um, mixing, and it, some drawbacks it has is that uh, if uh, this works if the, this uh, tracer causes no changes of the local properties of the fluid. If, however, the fluid we mix, uh, the liquid we mix, causes local changes in, the, in this cost, for example, then this approach may uh, not be appropriate. So let me try to go to the next slide. I'm moving now from batch to continuous. Um, this is the process we were looking before, a lot of mixing in uh, stirred vessels. Um, what uh, we also tried to look is uh, what happens if we move from uh, the batch processing to a continuous uh, processing using fully mixing uh, inline static mixers. Uh, in that case, and uh, within that project, we also looked at uh, uh, changes, 
changing a little bit the actual process. So instead, for example, of uh, having the gelation happening in the beginning and then mixing with a, a different fluid, the glycerol in that case, we saw what happens if we just mix the fluids from the beginning. And then once mixing is complete, we uh, uh, cause the gelation by a change in, um, in temperature. So moving from batch to continuous, well, we can argue that it leads to uh, more compact systems. There is a better um, control of the residence time. Um, so it might lead to shorter operating times. Um, the process we chose uh, involved lower viscosity fluids. So it is um, also um, more easy to mix. They are more easy to mix. And um, it, because it's more homogeneous, uh, this um, uh, the transport phenomena are a bit faster and uh, the temperatures are more homogeneous. It may mean that we can operate at lower temperatures. Um, so we um, developed uh, the CFT simulations to model uh, mixing within, uh, um, again, a continuous channel that had the static mixers. And this is the experimental setup for, for this configuration. Uh, in that case, experimentally, we looked at the mixing of two fluids that had to a different color. So we could observe, again, with part, uh, laser-induced fluorescence, what happens, uh, how does the mixing evolve. And uh, you see here some experimental results when uh, we use two different types of mixers. Uh, that's a, a Kenix mixer. This is a bit more uh, complex uh, mixer. And these mixers work with the principle of uh, splitting and recombining the fluid uh, uh, layers. So um, depending on how many elements uh, you have, uh, the fluids are split and then split again and split again until these striations become thin enough for diffusion to take over and complete the mixing. For these studies, we used um, a, a Newtonian fluid as reference and also um, three different types of non-Newtonian fluids. One was a Boger fluid uh, that had constant viscosity and then two shear thinning fluids that had uh, different uh, shear uh, thinningness and uh, uh, different also uh, relaxation times. And uh, we uh, carried out experiments and uh, CFT simulations. So what I, uh, you can see here is a CFT uh, results of uh, the mixing of, with one of these two mixers um, at different parts, let's say, of the mixer uh, using different elements. So this is after the first element, the second, and so on. And uh, we see this is the Newtonian case, and we see that uh, what we expect is, is actually happening. The fluid is uh, the two fluids are split, recombined, and so on until the mixing is better. Um, then we tried that uh, with CFT uh, with a different ratio of the phases. What we then try to do with the CFT uh, and experimentally is to uh, see what happens when we put the shear thinning fluids. In this case, we um, uh, the, uh, as I said, it's the fluids are viscous we don't have um, the, the flows are laminar. So what we saw is uh, perhaps not surprisingly, but what we saw is that the, uh, the, the shear thinningness in this case did not play a role on the mixing. Um, we still had the fluids being split and recombined the same way as in the Newtonian cases, as you can see here. So actually, in this case, we did not have an effect of the shear thinningness on um, the mixing patterns. What we found out, though, is that once we started increasing the velocities um, and uh, with the uh, fluids that uh, had also an elastic component, we then um, started observing um, um, other effects and instabilities. So one hour, uh, and you can see here some results uh, for different Deborah numbers and at some point for different Mach numbers as well. So when the Deborah numbers were low, then we had a behavior, the same behavior as in Newtonian uh, cases. However, when the Deborah numbers started increasing, as you can see, the, the solid part of the fluid uh, took, uh, took over in a way, and uh, the fluid um, um, layers were not splitting uh, as well. Um, so you can see here that after two elements, we don't have the split you would expect in, uh, in the case of the, let's say, the Newtonian case or the low Deborah number case. And uh, quite interestingly, when we went to even higher velocities, um, and as you can see, all Mach numbers, elastic Mach numbers above one, 
uh, we start getting these instabilities. It's like as if the fluids are breathing. Uh, there are these fluctuations that we try to, um, to measure because we can see the concentration and uh, we can see how uh, these boundaries move. Um, so we're doing a lot of this work and for all the fluids that I mentioned in the beginning, um, we uh, created this map. Uh, we have uh, published this work um, uh, and so you can see more details there. But uh, uh, we created this map of the elastic number, uh, which is the ratio of the elastic over the inertial forces, and the Mach number to, uh, to see uh, where in this map, in this, um, uh, within these um, uh, numbers, the different, uh, let's say, flow patterns occur. And uh, we are in this Newtonian like behavior when we are on the lower side of uh, the uh, crisis. Um, then uh, we start seeing the instability. So these sort of instabilities uh, and the fluctuations appear in this region here. So the next thing we tried to investigate was what happens when solids are added in inside fluids. And uh, in this case, the, the modeling can be uh, quite demanding. The approach we have been uh, developing at the UCL is uh, based on the mixture model where we uh, actually uh, measure the rheology of the suspension and then we implement it in CFD. Still, there need to be validations at various stages and for validations, in this case, we use pressure drop and also the particle concentration. What I'll show you uh, very briefly is some results where we compare the, uh, these uh, findings, these predictions of uh, safety to some uh, literature data on uh, the, what happens to the suspension that goes through a, a sudden expansion. Um, this is the uh, computational uh, results. And um, what you can see here also is the uh, comparison with these experiments from the literature. Uh, where this the circulation length is compared for experiments and for modeling. So as you can see, the agreement is very good. We then took this uh, approach, the mixture uh, approach, to, uh, to see if we could model uh, the flows of uh, dispersions, emulsions in uh, pipes, in channels. Um, this is the uh, configuration we were considering. Uh, we had a static mix in this case to create the dispersion. And um, uh, this, this is the information about the static mixer. And uh, we could uh, uh, record, we could do all our, as I'm showing you here, we could do uh, our laser induced fluorescent and particle image velocimetry techniques to obtain in a particle, in a pipe cross section, the concentration and the velocity profiles of the phases, which we would then compare with our CFDs, uh, CFD approaches. And what I have here is these findings, these results. Um, these are the images of the flow. Um, uh, we have an organic and an aqueous phase. We have our uh, tracer, the fluorescent tracer, inside our uh, aqueous phase, and that's why it appears brighter. Um, and uh, we have two different velocities uh, in the inlet, mixture velocities, and two different uh, for the same organic phase volume fraction. So the lower velocity, you can see the drops are bigger, higher velocity, the drops are smaller, the mixing is a little bit better as well. So this is the image, that's what we see. Um, we, of course, we can read this image and we can get these experimental results. Uh, what we have in uh, this uh, top part is the concentration, the organic phase concentration, which is, as you can see from the images, uh, higher on the top and very low at the bottom. Um, the same in the uh, when the uh, velocity is higher, um, and um, uh, at the bottom here we have the velocity profiles of the continuous phase. The continuous phase is mainly here, so we expect um, the, the velocity profiles to be uh, the velocities to be higher at the lower part of the pipe and lower at the uh, top. So on top of these images, I also put the CFD simulations, the CFD results. And um, uh, for the concentration and the velocity profiles, and as you can see, the agreement is is pretty good, especially because this is a, a, a quite a complex pattern. Uh, it's not homogeneously mixed, dispersed. There is this um, uh, almost um, almost pure uh, organic uh, water aqueous phase on the bottom, um, and still uh, it, it is possible with this computation with this uh, CFD approach to to model it. 
So um, some, some uh, let's say, recap, some uh, conclusions on uh, what we have so far. Uh, I hope I have uh, managed to show you that the numerical simulations can be a very powerful uh, tool for understanding and predicting the processing of complex formulations. And, uh, but we do need in every step of developing a computational tool to have this synergy with experiments, not just for uh, validation, uh, uh, but also because together both uh, approaches will help us to uh, have a better understanding and prediction of the flows. Um, I would like though to conclude with a couple more slides, so this is not my final one, to uh, mention some more recent approaches on uh, uh, machine learning and the use of machine learning technologies to improve these predictions. Uh, there, are, uh, there are talks later on about machine learning, so there will be more about that later. But um, the way we have been using um, machine learning uh, methodologies is, uh, is twofold, it's two ways, it's uh, um, twofold. So one can be to speed up the numerical simulations, and the other is to exploit very large already existing databases. And I'll show you a case where we have used these approaches um, in uh, formulations. So one um, uh, emulsions are used uh, in uh, many um, in many um, uh, products. Uh, these days, and uh, uh, microfluidics um, are widely used to uh, produce drops that have um, small sizes, but also very narrow size distributions. Um, and um, often in these cases, uh, surfactants are used to control the, um, for, to, for the stability of the emulsions, but also to control the size of the droplets. And um, of course, it's important to know what's this droplet size that can be uh, produced from a macrofluidic channel. So in this case, uh, we uh, tried to uh, see if we, can if we could combine uh, what we do with uh, experiments and with CFD with machine learning uh, approaches. Um, so this is the, the setup we have been looking. It's a macrofluidic channel uh, that produces drops. And um, you can see here some experimental results uh, for different concentrations of uh, surfactant, no surfactant, and two different concentrations. And um, um, that's, again, velocity uh, profiles, velocity uh, fields inside the droplets. And as you can see, the surfactant does have an effect on the velocities. Uh, we, miss, we lose the circulation pattern uh, we have here as the, um, uh, velocity, as the concentration of the surfactant increases. Uh, and this would affect the drop size. So within our, our uh, current APSRC uh, program grant premier, we try to, to combine um, physics-based approaches, which is the experiments or the CFD simulations with data-driven approaches based on uh, uh, existence and availability of data to um, provide predictions and uh, quantify their certainty. Uh, for, for multi-phase systems, for uh, complex systems. So um, what we did then, uh, and here are some results from this uh, work, is that we uh, used initially all the experimental data we had to derive a, a, a model for predicting the drop size in macrofluidic devices um, in the presence of surfactants. Um, and this is a model we have quantified these uh, parameters here. We then uh, used a very large database uh, that we had developed on uh, drop uh, formation and, um, um, and machine learning tools to, again, have a prediction of the drop size. And you can see here, oh, sorry, how does this prediction with uh, two different machine learning approaches compares with experimental data? Uh, this is actually a, a more easy approach, can be done within MATLAB. Uh, this is a more sophisticated one. Uh, from our colleagues in uh, um, uh, Data Science Institute at Imperial. And uh, um, yeah, as you can see, we can have uh, pretty good predictions. For us, this is more of a demonstration, uh, demonstration tool, but we plan to expand it to cover different microfluidic uh, channel uh, sizes, a larger uh, database of uh, experiments as well, and surfactants. So uh, with that, um, I would uh, like to uh, help to, to thank um, 
first of all, uh, my colleague, Dr. Luca Matsei, that uh, we've been working together on the uh, CFD tools for the simulations I've showed you. Um, and um, uh, many of our researchers that uh, have contributed to the experiments, the simulations, the slides I've just showed you. Um, some of them are in academic positions in, in other parts of the world or um, in UK and abroad. Um, and, and of course, our uh, um, sponsors, uh, EPSRC, uh, for um, a lot of help through uh, some big grants and smaller ones, and TU. And uh, um, some of the companies that have contributed uh, via studentships and uh, case studies to, uh, to what I showed you. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Panagiota. So uh, for the very interesting talk, uh, we, there are actually a few questions. I'm gonna read them from the chat. So the first question is uh, from uh, Philip Gill, one of the organizers. And the question is, what experimental data are, uh, do you find the hardest to acquire to validate your modeling? <laughs> uh, it, it can be many. Um, and um, the, of course, if you need the, the degree of detail uh, that I showed in some cases, for example, uh, uh, velocity fields or concentration profiles, uh, these, uh, these can be easy and hard to obtain. So, for example, in um, uh, techniques like that, um, or when we have, um, here it's more easy perhaps, but when we have the vessels. Um, so this can be perhaps not so tricky to obtain, but optical access, which, which can be a little bit demanding. It's more demanding if we want to get more whole volume information, because in that case, we either have to use, for example, for PAV, 3D PAV that involves more cameras. We lose a little bit on the resolution, the spatial resolution, if we do that. Another approach we used, because the spatial resolution, I haven't shown you results on that one here, is to, uh, to, to do repeat the experiment but a different uh, let's say slices uh, and then combine this data um, and of course this is pretty demanding and uh, because you have too much to, to see that then you compare the right uh, vectors in the right slices and so on um, and all these uh, techniques these particular techniques work um, with uh, good optical access and, and that's why it's, uh, th there is a certain level where experiments and modeling uh, can be directly compared. Uh, but then, of course, uh, we can do more things with the modeling once we have uh, established this, um, uh, we have validated and we are confident on uh, the results. Thank you. Having said that, there are other experimental techniques as well. And I'm, I'm sure people in the audience may have been trying them. Uh, there are tomographic systems, X-ray systems. We've been playing a lot with uh, acoustic and ultrasound techniques lately. Again, very powerful tools, but you need the right level of validation uh, to trust the results. Okay, thank you. The second question is uh, from Flora Sipishten. Thank you for the very interesting talk. What are the key elements from the non-Newtonian rheology that are needed to have an accurate description in CFD simulations? How important is the macro ma microscopic description of the system? Mm. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's very tricky. And uh, uh, actually it does depend on uh, how complicated your simulations can be. So what we showed you, what I showed you here is uh, simulations with um, uh, using Fluent, uh, where the, we have not been including uh, the elastic components. So mm -hmm. the, uh, the shear thinning is, is easy to, to, to include. Um, we have uh, been uh, trying and uh, my colleague, Dr. Luca Matze is, is working on that and we have a student to, to model in open form, uh, a lot to introduce because you can introduce the, uh, let's say the, the polymer, uh, some polymer models to try to also um, be able to simulate uh, elastic components. But of course the simulations get uh, more tricky. And again, if, if we want to consider more than one phase is present, uh, for example, particles in suspensions in uh, uh, viscoelastic media. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what we found in this case, just to say one more thing, is that uh, 
Uh, this um, it seems pretty simple, but it was actually in this case quite important to get this rheology quite correct, uh, to have a very good prediction between the CFT as I show here um, and the experiments. So the actual rheology, although we didn't include any elastic components, was the shear thinning behavior and the change with the temperature and the um, concentration uh, was important to completely capture to have a very accurate CFT. Okay. The last question is uh, from um, S.J. Anthony from the University of Leeds. Um, I wonder whether you use PIV in the case of suspensions, especially when the particle concentration is relatively high. Thank you. Right, we have uh, done, uh, again, I didn't show it here because we don't have the simulations. I was trying to have the, fo the, the focus on uh, the, the, the parts where we have actually compared. We have used PAV uh, and LIF uh, in suspensions of uh, a few percent uh, volume fraction. Um, once you uh, increase your, uh, yeah, suspend by matching refractive index of the solids, the fluids, and so on. Um, I think we managed to get up to a five, maybe a bit higher uh, percent. Uh, we've published some of this work, but then beyond that, of course, things become uh, more tricky. You can go a bit higher if you are very careful. It depends also on the size of the particles. If the particles are a bit bigger, then it's, it's more easy to, to increase the concentration. If the particles get very small, then it, it is quite demanding. It's, it's more difficult. And that's then why other techniques might be, uh, it's worth considering other techniques as well. There is another question, which I think you just answered, which is about, thank you very much for the wonderful talk. In, in case of suspensions, how high particle volume fraction could you simulate numerically also in your experiments? So the, the, what we've done here, this is the mixture approach. And uh, there is, I'm um, uh, uh, just trying to go here. This is a mixture of the, the mixture approach. And if I show you even these results here, um, we can, um, um, I will let my, uh, my colleagues, uh, Rashid and uh, Luca, to uh, comment more on the actual details of developing the safety model. But as you can see here, we can get high concentrations and the same with uh, with this case where we have uh, particle suspensions but this is the mixture model and there are certain uh, limitations let's say certain considerations um, if you try to do individual particles then yeah i mean then it, it becomes very demanding and then of course um, you have to have a trade-off on uh, how much you can do and how long you can wait Okay, maybe have a very quick question about your machine learning approach, very interesting as well. So um, considering that some of these uh, products are uh, quite impure, so they contain a lot of impurities, do you find uh, uh, so that th therefore the distribution of the data is very large? Do you think that this could uh, be a problem when you try to, because basically fitting your data with the machine learning or any kind of, the kind of uh, numerical methods? Uh, within the machine learning tools. This, yeah, uh, this is actually learning for us as well. And that's why we used uh, this system here, because over the years we had uh, quite a few experimental data using, uh, so the, these results I show you here are from uh, three different surfactants, concentrations that go below and above CMC, um, but uh, using a very specific geometry. So and that's why it was a great learning experience within progr the program grand premier to work uh, experimentalists, CFT modelers, and uh, uh, data uh, people, machine learning people, and and see um, uh, to try to have a common language. So uh, and for us, this is an indication. You could argue this is not the most difficult uh, uh, case to model. We we had the a model uh, that we had from experiments uh, based on experiments and on safety simulations combining the data. So it was not a case where we were actually looking for a model, but it was a good uh, um, case to, to, to study. And, um, um, and in that case, combining all this data, and there was a lot of discussion um, among the team, uh, within the team on what we want to predict, which data do we include in our database? Because you have to have nice data sets 
while experimentally, sometimes you have the drop size, sometimes you have the drop frequency, sometimes you don't measure one aspect, the same with CFD. So it was a, quite a, a cumbersome work, I would say, to, to have this database. But once it was there, having the fluids that we had um, in the labs, um, which could may or may not have had impurities, but that's why I mentioned we had a, a, a quite a lot of surfactant concentrations, which perhaps is a little bit like the impurities. Um, then we were able to, to develop these models. And uh, there is in, in every one of those, there would be the, um, we, we used the model or the data as the, um, the correct, uh, the, this, mm -hmm. is the, the, this is the answer. So this is a difference from the, the correct, let's say, uh, value. Um, yeah, the predictions were very good. And of course we had a big enough database to, to have a large number of data for developing the model and then some for testing it. And the idea is that we now continue with this one. And the more surfactants we add, uh, another uh, thing we would like to do is to include different geometries as well. So we have a, a model that it's not just for one particular microfluidic inlet, but for a number of them, uh, can predict drop size in the micro channels. OK, thank you very much. So there are no other questions. We are also perfect on time. So thank you very much again, Professor Angeli. We can't uh, clap, but I'm sure everybody is clapping at home. Uh, and we can move.